Okay, so uh, our next speaker is uh, Regis from Aisar Pune. Can you hear? And, uh, it's, it's, it's on, okay. Uh, thanks, Ashok, for the introduction. Uh, thank you, the organizer, for uh, giving me an opportunity to present uh, uh, some of the reason what we are doing. Uh, <clears throat> so I know uh, it's almost the end of the day. I will try to make it uh, short. So this is about uh, dynamics of overlapping bright solid on in spin one condensate. So we have seen, uh, I think some of the talks already mentioned about the bright solitons. So we just asked this question, suppose you bring two bright solitons closer. So whether, what they do actually, whether they like to, uh, or they dislike each other. So that's a question we will see. And you see that sometimes they like, sometimes they don't like, and uh, sometimes they convert into something different, okay? Uh, uh, for the spin one condensate. So this is what we are going to see. Uh, uh, so uh, the bright solitons are self-trapped condensates and uh, they require attractive interactions. And uh, unfortunately they are stable only in 1D and uh, 2D and 3D the condensate collapse. So uh, the whole condensate become unstable. So this is, uh, uh, so experimentally the people have already seen the formation of bright solitons. Here you see a, an array of bright solitons. Uh, in experience, what they do is they create a repulsive stable condensate and uh, use the fish back resonance uh, to drive to attractive interaction and that create basically a, an array of bright solid. Okay. And uh, the nature of the interaction between two bright solitons depends on the relative phase between the solitons. And uh, for some reason, uh, experimentally, they always see the solitons have a relative phase of pi. That means uh, they repel each other. And because of the harmonic confinement, they create an array of uh, stable soliton train, okay? And uh, this is also, you have seen, uh, the physics of these solitons is described by the, in the mean field uh, level, the gross pitevsky equation. And the first term is the kinetic energy. And uh, among the most important term is the interparticle interaction, okay? And this G is proportional to the S wave scattering length because of the low energy collisions. And in order to get bright soliton, you need this A to be uh, negative. That means attractive interaction between the two atoms. And uh, people have done uh, more beautiful experiments using uh, bright solitons. For instance, they created two bright solitons in a single harmonic confinement. And then they put a uh, Gaussian barrier in between. And then they remove this and then they, they can study the collisional dynamics, okay? And depending on the collision, uh, the relative phase between the initial solitons, you can see here that uh, as time goes along this vertical axis, it can fuse or here you see that it doesn't fuse off. Uh, there is a repulsion and here you can say that the relative phase is zero and here it say that the relative phase is phi, okay? Between the bright solitons. So basically this is a collisional dynamic. So that means you have a harmonic confinement, you create slightly far, so they accelerate towards the center. Uh, uh, so that is the collisional dynamics people have studied. And why the solitons are uh, interesting because uh, they are non-diffusive in nature and uh, you can use it for applications like uh, atom interferometry. There are many proposals and also used to uh, atom transport, okay? So these are very ideal candidates for this due to the non-diffusive nature of the uh, bright solitons. Okay, uh, so what I was talking about scalar condensate, I was just giving the introduction, but uh, you can see that you can consider rubidium 87 and Satrishi was also showing the level structure. And if you trap these atoms in the F equal to one, you have this hyperfine structure, which includes the three states, zero, minus one, and plus one. So basically you can have a spin one uh, condensate. And uh, this has been realized a long time ago, almost in the beginning of the, uh, realization of both sensing condensation in Ketterle's group and so on. So when you have the three component BC, which is basically called the spinal spin one condensate, okay? <clears throat> and uh, the physics of the spin one condensate is now described by the uh, Hamiltonian, which is given here. And the first term is the kinetic energy of all the components. And the second term, which goes like n cap square, and n cap is the total density operator for all the magnetic components. And this plays the same role as the G, which I was showing before, which goes like a G size, okay, in the short range case. 
So you don't have to think too much. Uh, this C0 terms is just act like the G in the scalar case. But the most interesting term is this uh, one which goes with C1, uh, which is F square. It's more like Heisenberg term uh, if you, uh, in general spin models. So that is this spin density operator. And uh, so why it is interesting, uh, there is uh, one thing you can, this term can introduce spin changing collisions. For instance, if you start with uh, two atoms, one is in M equal to one, one equal to M equal to minus one. So this can uh, collisionally convert to two M equal to zero and vice versa, okay? So this build up the coherence between the different spin components, okay? So then you have a single coherent spinal condensate. <clears throat> And uh, so that is the interesting thing about the spin one condensate compared to this scalar case, okay? And now uh, let me look at the people who have explored the bright solitons in spin one condensate. So in the scalar case, it's interesting because it's a self-trap condensate. You, need, you don't need a harmonic confinement. And in the case of spin one, based on this uh, spin vector, which is chi, you can see psi of Z, uh, the seek, function is the typical self-trapped profile of the bright soliton. And depends on this chi, the spin vector, you can classify uh, the bright solitons into two major classifications. If you can write the chi in this form, uh, zero, one, zero, but uh, up to some rotating unitary matrix defined by the Euler angles, uh, alpha, beta, theta, okay? So then you can see that uh, all the population is in equal to zero state. And that means there is no net magnetization. And in the ferromagnetic solitons, it can be either in this uh, uh, m equal to plus or minus one. So here I just wrote m equal to plus one. So this is the magnetization which is this maximally polarized. You can say it's a maximally polarized bright soliton. <clears throat> so these are the uh, two kinds of bright soliton. So now uh, I will ask the following questions. Uh, suppose. What about the m equal to zero? Which one? But you are talking about m equal to minus one and plus one. M equal to zero. No, there are two two class of solitons. Okay. So if the spin vector is in this form, it is polar solitons. If it is this in the, it is a ferromagnet. Yeah. So there are only plus and minus. One. Exactly. So so I mean, like you can have the ferromagnetic with the, okay. Uh, so uh, we ask this question, suppose I have a scalar condensate, I put two bright solitons nearby, and you see that a delta is the distance between the center of two solitons. And this delta I can use as a parameter to control the extent of overlap, okay? So if delta is very large, I can say these solitons are not so close to each other. And we can ask what will happen to this soliton. Actually, this is a problem studied in optical solitons in much detail, experimentally and theoretically, okay? Because this has a lot of applications in optical uh, pulse propagations and I mean, like, uh, fiber optics and so on. But this has been not really well addressed in the condensate uh, part. And you can see that when I go to the spin, uh, we have some uh, slightly more novel scenarios compared to this, okay? So the red is one kind of polar soliton the red one, and the blue is a different kind of polar solid, okay? So we will see what are the output. So what I do is I just uh, initially create this and let it evolve in time and see what happens to this, okay? So first look at the scalar condensate. And as I said before, the nature of the interaction between two solitons depends on the relative phase phi here. So seek, is the first soliton on the left side and the seek uh, is at plus delta by two is the soliton on the right side. This is a two soliton solution separated by a distance uh, capital delta, okay? And if somebody wants to know much more details about the nature of the interactions, how it depends on the relative phase, you can look at this reference. Uh, uh, and what you see for phi equal to zero, so they attract, so they fuse together but it's a dynamical problem. So they are very energetically high and they come back to the uh, initial situation. And this is like a perpetual dynamics, a periodic dynamics, fusion and coming back to the initial condition and so on, okay? And this is basically due to the fact that they have attractive interaction between the solitons. And uh, the vertical axis is the time and they said is my, uh, the position axis is on the x-axis, okay? So now uh, we can increase the phi to pi by two 
now the solitones will have some repulsion but you see i started with identical solitones but i ended up with uh, on the left side a much slightly brighter soliton in the sense that the density is much larger compared to the initial soliton so that means in the very initial stage of the dynamics there is a transfer of atoms between from the one soliton to the other and the direction of this atom transfer i can control it because it's basically a superfluid flow so the gradient of phase will give me this direction in which this flow happens and uh, in the optical context people use this as optical switching okay and they have some applications they have two pulse which is propagating and they can switch one pulse to the next channel and they use this as a optical switching and uh, the whole idea is to develop optical networks okay and uh, in principle we can uh, we call it as atomic switching because you see that a part of the atoms has been uh, moved into the the second uh, uh, solid atom and i was showing here the result for delta equal to 10 l perpendicular that is relatively a weak overlap between the initial solitons i will later show you what happened if i increase this extent of overlap slightly stronger okay uh, so if i have phi equal to pi that means the relative phase between the two solitons is pi you have a nodal point that is equal to zero that somehow prevent any flow of atom from one soliton to the other so you will have an isotropic repulsion between the two solitons okay so the message is like uh, so if i just create two solitons and put some initial overlap there is some interesting dynamics and this dynamics critically depends on the relative phase between these two solitons okay and in fact the nature of the interaction between the solitons uh, uh, depends on the phase the relative phase okay so uh, uh, this uh, uh, uh -huh. so why does it preferentially go to the left i mean is the no this is the way we imprint the phase okay so the the phase gradient the it, it will the flow is along the delphi direction okay so if i change the phi to minus pi then i can change the direction okay so uh, basically if you take this phi to be uh, the negative then it will go to the upper i mean yeah there will be uh, uh, yeah exactly uh, just one question uh, Uh, do you, do you have scenarios when which you can uh, collide the solitons and they can pass through each other and then yeah yeah definitely definitely this is elastic spotting it always happen at large kinetic energies uh, okay. but do you have any plot for that no because it, this i didn't want to collide them okay. i just want to start at a rest but with an overlap okay, okay. thanks the collision problem is also interesting but it's uh, slightly different actually. okay thanks yeah. so what i wanted to point out that initially when you say you know These are like usual Hasegawa uh, topper that kind of soliton, right? What you have in fibers. Uh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. These are like this Hasegawa topper kind of uh, what you have in fibers, that kind of soliton. Exactly, exactly. Right? Without any deformation, right? Exactly, exactly. So this has been extensively studied in the case of uh, optical solitons in fibers. Yes, okay. Oh, oh. oh, so uh, oh, so the, the, there are two solitons, right? Exactly. And then the atoms are attracting, right? Exactly. So, if the solitons are also attracting, I think there will be questions of stability. They will just collapse. No, it's they, a one-day situation. It's a one-day. There is no collapse. Yeah, no. But uh, if you look at the solitary trains, what Stecker et al. has observed, exactly, exactly. There, the solitons are repelling. Atoms are attracting. That is why they are stable. Yeah, that is because of the so pi... balance between the solitons. So the distance between the solitons, they maintain the distance. and they propagate for very longer you know time so the, the relative phase between any two soliton in that yeah. soliton train is pi right exactly so, so they are stable. pointing out there will be always a negative sign right which one so because if you see the model of stecker et al and then there is a always a negative sign in between the solitons so that they repel each other uh, no that we can engineer that we can engineer sorry the phi we can engineer no means you cannot that's what i'm saying that if you take a uh, attractive one then that cannot be stable unless you you know confine the each of the individual solitons in a trap and if no, you allow so, them to collapse so in 1d there is no collapse in one dimension in 1d there is no collapse for single soliton right no any soliton so it cannot collapse in 1d no uh, okay so yeah, uh, solitary trains yeah to make them stable because they are all attracting right no so, so in a solitary train so, so let's take a solitary train 
Yeah. Okay. So it is. So they st they stay like a train because there is a relative phase of pi between the solid. Exactly. So that, so means that, that they is, are repelling each other. Exactly. That is formed when you create a dynamically modulation instability or something. Yeah. So okay. what is the difference here? So the difference is you now how the stability is coming. That's what I. No, no. Here so, one day the well, solitons are stable. Yeah. Can we can you just discuss it? Yeah, yeah. Sure. We have okay. to the talk. Okay. Okay. Uh, so. Uh, so this slide, I just want to show that uh, you can control the property of the solitons by controlling the extent of overlap. For instance, uh, the frequency of the uh, the uh, bound state of two molecules, two solitons, which I was showing uh, for phi equal to zero, and also the transfer of mass from one to the other soliton also can be controlled by the extent of overlap. And also in the case of phi equal to pi, you have a symmetric solitons which propagate with some finite velocity. And that also can be controlled by uh, delta, okay? So now let me go to the uh, spinal case. Uh, spinal case, as I said before, uh, there are two kinds of solitons. One is polar solitons and ferromagnetic solitons. We just uh, restrict ourselves to polar solitons. So we have two different kinds of polar solitons. One is a uh, red one, where the population is shared between m equal to plus and minus one. And the blue uh, is a second soliton on the right side of its are equal to zero, where all the population is in the m equal to zero state, okay? Uh, so keep in mind that uh, the self-trapping is by making C zero equal to negative. So that will make sure that uh, they are bright solitons. And in general, to analyze, uh, the property of the overlapping soliton for the spinal case is slightly more complicated because you have an additional parameter, which is the spin dependent interaction, spin changing collision, the C1 term. So I have three parameters. One is C1, the spin changing collision. And the other one is the delta, which tells me how, ex how much the extent of overlap. And then the relative phase phi, uh, which now appears in the spin vector of the solitons, okay? <clears throat> so the dynamics is given by the uh, vector Grosbeck-Pitevsky equation, and you can see that all the terms which I have explained before. And uh, as I said before, the dynamics now depends on the ratio between the spin-dependent interaction, which is the C1, where I was showing the spin-changing collisions. Uh, with respect to the normal contact, like uh, density interaction, which is the C0, and also the phi and delta, okay? So if I uh, tune all these parameters, I will get different scenarios, but I'm not going into all the scenarios, but I will just selectively look at three important scenarios, which we saw. One is like a Josephson-like oscillations for each magnetic component. And the second scenario is out of, so you start with two polar solitons and you let it evolve in time, and then you end up with four ferromagnetic solitons, okay? So this is also very nice because you start with one kind of solitons, two in number, but finally you end up with four uh, different kinds of solid. And uh, this, sorry, this is not oscillations, it is oscillatons, it's automatically corrected to oscillations. So it's a, a different kind of exotic uh, solitons seen in the spin one case. I will explain this later, uh, this will be my last part, okay? <clears throat> so it is not oscillations, it is oscillatons, uh, they named it as oscillatons, okay? What are your conservation laws in this case? Which one? What are your conservation laws in this propagation problem? This one, uh, so I will come to that uh, because we conserve the energy and magnetization and so on. I will, I will come to that, okay? Uh, okay, uh, so let's uh, look at the first case, uh, uh, which is putting no spin changing collisions, okay? So it's almost like a two component, uh, three component BEC or something like that, okay? So we don't consider in spin changing collision. So that means the m equal, let's say two atoms in m equal to plus minus one, converting to two m equal to zero process is absent here. So each of the population, the population in each magnetic components are conserved, okay? Uh, but in the presence, gamma is non-zero, that process is not always true. The population oscillations in spin component can be observed, but the total magnetization is conserved for any value of gamma, okay? <clears throat> so the first part is the population in m equal to plus minus one. If you look at that, my red soliton, which has 
population in m equal to plus minus one. That is what you see here on the left side. And what happens is it goes to the right side and it come back and it's more like a uh, uh, oscillation of the m equal to plus minus component from left to right and right to left. Okay. And similarly, if you look at the m equal to zero component, what you see is like a similar kind of oscillation. Now it's Question. going from right to. Uh, why the, this is not symmetric? So eh? On the left and right side, the oscillation over time. Uh, this will come. We'll, I will explain that. Okay. Uh, so if I look at the total density, it will get something like that. I, I will come to that. Okay. Uh, uh. So uh, typically in the Josephson oscillation case, we can look at the population in balance between two double well potential, let's say typically in the double well potential, I will come to that double well potential, how it comes here. And then that will explain that uh, asymmetric side. And uh, this is the population imbalance, which oscillate like a uh, Josephson oscillation, uh, but not like a sinusoidal kind of oscillation. And this delta is a spacing between the two peaks in the total density, uh, where you don't really think about the magnetic components. So the reason is, when this delta is smaller, that means this total, the peak in the total density coming closer. So the tunneling process is enhanced, okay? And that's the reason why you see a very steep maximum and minima here. And when they are far, that means when delta is large, the tunneling process is very small. That is why you see this kind of asymmetric uh, structure in the uh, dimension, okay? So uh, you can, see that in this gamma equal to zero, so I have to write down this uh, vector gross Petrovsky equation, then you can see that the effect of other components on let's say m equal to one, uh, the, the effect from m equal to minus one and m equal to zero and m equal to plus one is just to create a double well kind of potential for the uh, other component. So the other two components make a double well kind of potential for the third component. And that way you can see that uh, uh, the Josephson like oscillations can take place here. Uh, if you don't interpret this way, I mean, it can give a false impression that uh, there is a, a spin changing collision takes place, okay? So this is the first case. Uh, when gamma is equal to zero, you can see a uh, uh, Josephson-like oscillations. It's struck again. Oh, okay. So if you look at the red and blue, they are basically the uh, m equal to plus minus one component and m equal to zero component, they're basically oscillating between the two points, uh, resembling the dynamics like that of the Josephson oscillations, okay? Okay, uh, so uh, here we can also, so we found that in this case, uh, the density dynamics is independent of the relative phase, but we saw that uh, uh, the magnetization dynamics depends on the relative phase. And uh, I just quickly here, if somebody is interested, I can later talk about it. Uh, so what we see is that in the spin dynamics, we see a uh, oscillating domain walls in the spin dynamics, okay? So even it's not just the, uh, the, the importance of this spin one bright soliton is not just the dynamics in the real space, but also in the spin space, you can see very interesting uh, spin dynamics like here, yeah, oscillating uh, domain walls and so on, okay? <clears throat> So let's go to the second scenario. So now I put the spin changing in the strength of the spin changing collision is same as the, uh, the on-site density density interaction that is gamma equal to one. Then what we see is we start with the two, uh, this is my time axis, this is my Z axis. So I started with the two polar solitons and I see that it emerged out as a four solitons. And if you look at the central inner solitons, it exactly showing the dynamics of two scalar solitons with a relative phase of zero, okay? And the outer solitons are showing a relative phase of the dynamics identical to the relative phase of pi, okay? And uh, if you look at the spin density, you can see that uh, uh, the, the color indicates one particular value, whether it is pointed, in this case, the spins are oriented along the x-axis or negative x-axis. So you can see that the inner solitons are ferromagnetic, and the outer solitons are also ferromagnetic, but opposite polarization, okay? So the inner solitons, all the spins are along one direction and the outer solitons along the opposite direction. And if you change the relative phase of my initial polar solitons, I can again manipulate 
the dynamics of the, my final ferromagnetic solitons, okay? Actually, all of this can be easily understood by rotating to a different frame. And, uh, uh, oh, sorry, uh, in which uh, if I move to another frame, the problem has magically reduces to a two component non-interacting, two different independent scalar condensate. And then I can see why we saw similar dynamics like the scalar condensate I said before, okay? So if somebody is interested, I can uh, later discuss. So uh, this is the dynamics which we were talking before for scalar condensate. So basically you rotate to a different frame and the spin physics has been magically reduces to that of two independent scalar condensate. Uh, actually, I have to say that this is strictly only the case when gamma equal to one, okay? So anyway, what we saw is like uh, two polar solitons come together and giving a two ferromagnetic solid. So this is the oscillatons, uh, here it is correct actually. So it is not oscillations, it is oscillatons. So these oscillatons are a very exotic uh, solitons, which uh, these guys found in 2010 uh, for a single spinal condensate. So what happens is the total density profile is stationary, okay? If you look at in time, the total density profile remains the same, but internally, the population in M equal to plus minus one and M equal to zero is having a, oscillatory dynamics uh, with some fixed frequency. And uh, because of this oscillating nature of the internal uh, population dynamics, they call it as oscillating solitons. But if you look at the total density, they're just sitting peacefully there, okay? So uh, this is it. So surprisingly, when we put these two polar solitons with a initial small overlap, you see that uh, the final output is basically this, these oscillatons. Okay, uh, uh, at a particular, uh, it was not a particular case, but I'm showing it only for a particular case. So the gamma you can tune and you can still, it was very robust actually. You can tune any different value of gamma and especially for pi equal to pi by two, uh, I will see that uh, the oscillators are emerging as the final product. Okay, so I, so this can be seen as a proposal how to generate such uh, exotic, bright solitons in spin condensate. So basically to create a polar solitons is easy compared to the oscillatons. And what you have to do is you take these two polar solitons and make the initial overlap. And here you see that uh, the population in, let's say M equal to minus one, they are oscillating in time. This is the time axis. And similarly for M equal to zero. But if you look at the total density, you don't see anything. There is no oscillation here actually, okay, in time. So these are the oscillatons. So uh, I will show you the uh, dynamics. So you wait for some time, you see that the black curves is not showing much oscillations, but the internal population, the red and the green is oscillating with a fixed frequency. And interestingly, uh, in our case, the oscillation frequency can be controlled by the extent of overlap. Uh, uh, so you can make it faster or you can make it smaller and so on. Okay. So this can lead to a control prop for the uh, oscillators, okay? So with this, I think uh, I just want to conclude that uh, with overlapping spin one solitons compared to the scalar soliton, there are rich scenarios. And uh, if you take the three striking one, these are Josephson-like oscillations, uh, ferromagnetic solitons and uh, oscillatons. And this work is basically done by my master student, Gautam and also my PhD student, Sandra. Uh, and thank you for your attention. And there is a poster also in here by Redijit on double dipolar comments. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So thanks, Regis. So maybe we can take a few questions. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, five so uh, I asked you the question about the conservation laws. So you said that you will say a comment on that. Sorry, what? Conservation laws. What are the conservation laws you demand for integrating your system? You have to impose certain conservation laws, right? What are they? So, no, here, okay. So, that is when you look for the stationary solitons, right? Right. Okay. So, here, uh, uh, we are not looking at the stationary solutions. We are looking at the dynamical solutions. Okay. So, um, so here, uh, we start with the polar solitons and then uh, looking at the dynamical uh, case. And uh, uh, 
uh, I mean, this is all I can comment at this point, actually. Uh, so the question could be like, what are the conservation laws for the polar solitons, right? Okay, then the other part of the question is that for standard solitons, you can construct the lax pairs, your equations are integrable or something. So can you construct lax pairs for your problem? Actually, so the people have uh, studied this problem, the integrability of this uh, 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 spin one equations. So actually, uh, so the one point they found is the gamma equal to one uh, is the point at which the equations are integrable. And uh, that is one case where they also see the formation of oscillatons, okay? So apart from that, uh, uh, all the points, then it was numerically solved, actually. I see, okay, thanks. Uh, sorry, maybe this is a related question actually. So, uh, in the in the integrable case, uh, uh, are there multi soliton solutions? Exactly. So it can be n soliton solution. Yeah. I see. But uh, but in the other cases, you have one soliton solution. Yeah. Exactly. So one soliton, and we took the two soliton solution. Okay. So the gamma equal to one is that special point where uh, you get the n soliton solution. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, just one more extension of this question. This uh, two two soliton case, if you have, they're yeah. also could be expecting this kind of thing. That the overlap is almost. Uh, let's say you can you can control that to some extent between this uh, n soliton solutions. You have you have direct control over the spacing between the solitons. Yeah, exactly. And exactly. you would expect. Uh, uh, this is actually something which we are extending to three soliton first because it's not very easy for me to comment on the dynamics. Okay, fine. Thanks. Yeah, very interesting question, actually. Yeah, this is, we are planning to extend to three solid terms, yeah. Okay, so I, since there is no more question, then let's thank um, Regis for this wonderful talk.